Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. You know Alex has worked for years in the comic book business, creating epic images from DC and Marvel's history, but also Star Wars, the Universal Monsters. And of course, in recent years, Alex has expanded into Hollywood with great prints featuring the Beatles, the Monkees, Monty Python, and a whole lot more. Go to Alex's website, alexrossart.com, and you will find prints, original art, and pieces that are priced at every price point so you can find affordable Alex Ross art to grace your living room or man cave. There's also sketchbooks and art books like last year's Alex Ross Unseen featuring crossovers never seen before like a Star Wars Star Trek piece and several Star Wars DC Universe crossovers. It's all waiting for you at alexrossart.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Garth Ennis is back on Word Balloon. Now, back in the fall for Baltimore Comic Con, Joe Ryband interviewed Garth, and I presented it on Word Balloon as a video and an audio. And, uh, you know, I was kind of bummed that I couldn't talk to Garth. I've been trying to talk to Garth for uh, the 15-plus years that I've been doing Word Balloon. 16th anniversary next month, by the way, for Word Balloon. Uh, but uh, the opportunity came up now because uh, he has a brand new uh, representation of some great stories that he did in his Battlefield comic. And uh, it's all about tankies, uh, a British troop that uh, is manning a Churchill tank during World War II and the Korean War as well. It was written by Garth. It was drawn by Carlos Esquera, the great Judge Dredd uh, co-creator and artist. And uh, it's fantastic. It, it's great. And, you know, Garth does an incredible job with his war stories. I'm sure you're aware of his uh, many years of doing uh, soldier stories. And uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan. So uh, I will say that if you're looking for a boys conversation, I will point you back to that fall Word Balloon episode with Joe Ryban talking to Garth. This is about Garth's war comics and specifically about tankies, but really uh, his entire body of work and just his philosophy of how to do war stories. Man, it is always gritty. It is always violent in the way that a war story should be, story should be in an honest uh, way. And uh, he never pulls punches, and his artists never pull punches. And uh, Tankies is a perfect example of that. Dead Reckoning, uh, the great publisher, is uh, representing Tankies in a brand new volume, and it's absolutely worthy of your attention. Garth Ennis, talking war stories on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners, my followers of uh, Word Balloon, via Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Uh, thank you very much, League. Truly, uh, as I've said before, it's been a great help to me uh, this past year. I've tried to expand Word Balloon. I'm continuing to do so. We've got a lot of interesting projects that are underway, and it's all due to the support of the Word Balloon listeners via Patreon. If you'd like to subscribe, it's patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. April's going to be a fun month for Aftershock. Lots of really neat stuff happening. Uh, we've got the third part of Shadow Doctor coming from Peter Calloway and George Genty. Uh, that will be out at the end of the month. Also, uh, April 12th, you've got Eden, the prestige format One Shock, as uh, they put it in Aftershock, with uh, Cullen Bunn and Talabak Tazjelik. Uh, they have been a great team, and it's great to see something new in the horror world from them. Also, Animosity Year, year 3, the collection, is uh, coming from Marguerite Bennett. And Raphael De La Tour, that's coming on April 21st. Uh, also, uh, I Breathed a Body uh, is already out. Zach Thompson, Andy McDonald, issue three. So you should definitely check that out. Stephanie Phillips with Nuclear Family, that continues as well for Aftershock. Uh, she and Tony Chastine with that really neat 50s Cold War story. Uh, plus, they have a brand new imprint for uh, young adults, and it's called uh, Seismic Press. And their first release for that is going to be Rainbow Bridge. It's by uh, Steve Orlando and Steve Fox. Uh, and uh, it's illustrated by Valentina Brancati. Uh, it's coming out this summer. And uh, it's a brand new imprint for Aftershock Comics. they got a lot going on 
that deserves your attention. So uh, don't uh, hesitate to uh, go to their website and find out more information about these and other fine books from Aftershock Comics. They're a great sponsor of Word Balloon, and they deserve your attention. They always have top writers and artists making really great books that you are not going to find at any other publisher. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages of art, and the diamond coats on how to order these books and more at AfterShockComics.com. Garth Ennis, welcome to Word Balloon. It's great to see you, and, and thank you for doing this chat. Well, thanks, John. It's great to be here. Uh, I got to tell you, man, I was just telling you off the air, uh, I've been a longtime fan of your war stories going back to the D.C. years and really excited about Tankies. Am I right? Um, this was, uh, I mean, obviously, poor Carlos passed away uh, just a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Um, mm-hmm. Is this an expansion of what you guys did years before? Because I have the original 78 page, you know, collection of the three issues. Right, right. The series from Battlefields. Yes, this is all the tanky stories from the Battlefield series collected under one set of covers uh, by Dead Reckoning. Just the same way that they did the Night Witches also from from Battlefields. Um, just an arrangement that we were able to come to between Dynamite, who published Battlefields, and Dead Reckoning. That's cool, man. Uh, God, and you know, again, I know you had uh, uh, collaborated with Carlos on War Stories prior to this in, in your War <laughs> Stories uh, series yeah. as well. Um, so obviously he was always up for uh, a new war story with you, I'm assuming. Oh, very much. Um, yeah, he, uh, he and I liked working together anyway, and he always told me he enjoyed my scripts because they were so, they were so simple, which is what he was used to. Um, coming up uh, in British comics and working with people like John Wagner and Alan Hebden and Pat Mills, I think he had a, um, a long tradition of, of the kinds of scripts where the writer just stays out of the way. He tells the artist what he needs, um, but apart from that, he really just leaves the artist to tell the story, and that was what Carlos always appreciated. When did your uh, fascination with war comics begin? Uh, as a little kid, really, while, while everyone else was reading superhero comics, um, I found myself reading British war comics in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, um, really just a quirk in distribution. Uh, I've mentioned this before a couple of times, but because of the, uh, the place I, the particular part of Northern Ireland I grew up in, um, we got the British mainstream titles. The distribution was fine on those. So 2000 AD, Judge Dredd, um, number of other things, and a ton of war comics. But the American stuff, the superhero stuff, uh, I saw only rarely, only occasionally, either imported or in the British reprint titles that Marvel UK put out. Um, It was very rare that I ran across those, and I never really had a chance to enjoy the stories with any degree of coherence. I wasn't able to sort of build up a a run of any of these things. And when when you're looking into superhero comics from the outside, uh, it can be, as a kid, it can be quite daunting. It seems like there are dozens of titles um, that have been going on for so many years. The British stuff, on the other hand, was just there right in front of me, and it was easy to get hold of. And um, it was um, it, it was the, the great war comics of the era, uh, Commando, uh, War Picture Library, and most obviously Battle, which was the British weekly anthology that uh, that featured characters like Johnny Red and Charlie's War that I that I picked up, um, and that I think fed into. Um, fed into my interest in military history. And as that developed from the comics and, you know, I then you know, went through adolescence and grew up and found myself writing my own comics, it gave me a chance to do what everyone in comics does, which is to put my own spin on the material I read as a kid. It just, it just so happened that, was, that for me it was war comics. Well, uh, again, your, your level of research that you put into your stories is very apparent. And uh, I, I've I've enjoyed your your war comics for years. Um, who were? Do you know who the writers were? Did they credit the writers in books like Battle in that? As far as and the art and the artists, not initially, but uh, on Battle they did start too. Um, and so you had Pat Mills who wrote Charlie's War, John Wagner, Darkies Mob, HMS Nightshade, uh, Tom Tully 
wrote Johnny Red. Um, Alan Hebden and Jerry Finley Day also did a great deal of work for for Battle. Um, these uh, obviously John and Pat because of 2008 are probably that bit better known, but the other guys Jerry and Alan and and Tom. Um, they were sort of the unsung heroes of British comics at the time. They did a lot of work. Uh, some of it's still uncredited even then. Um, but they wrote the bulk of the material, the, the better material that uh, appeared in Battle. Um, and I would credit them with uh, be, being a big part of my kind of comics reading development. That's cool. Am I right? Did Jerry uh, co-create Rogue Trooper? Yes, he did with Dave Gibbons. Um, he did a... All those guys did a lot of stuff for 2000 AD. Um, Alan did Meltdown Man. Tom Tully wrote Harlem Heroes, Inferno. Uh, I think they all worked on Dan Dare at one point or another. Sure. <laughs> um, it was really on 2000 AD. I think the credits were first introduced in British comics. I think what happened was Kevin O'Neill, uh, who you might you probably know from League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and so on, um, he was working as art editor at the time and completely against the rules, he introduced credits for writers, artists and letters. And apparently when the publisher said, here, what's this? What, what on earth is this doing here? <laughs> Kev just said, oh, it's just it's just something we're trying. It's a new idea we've had. If it doesn't work, we'll take it off. And the guy, you know, probably the publisher probably thinking about a hundred other things that day said, yeah, OK, what, whatever. And that was how credits were introduced in British comics. And so that spread to battle and so on. And, and that was how my generation got to know the names of the people who, who created our comics, uh, all thanks to Kev. Interesting and thankfully that that actually happened because mm. it's, uh, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a student of uh, comics history and I've had the pleasure of talking to Pat and Dave has been on a lot. And I've talked a lot about not only the obvious with Dave, but also you know, again, mm -hmm. dipping into the 2008 years, yeah, of course. years and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he was there from the beginning. Have you? Uh, ha did you ever have the opportunity? Because again, you know, uh, with American Comics, a uh, big fan of uh, what obviously Joe Kubert did, Russ mm -hmm. people like that. Did you have the chance to uh, uh, collaborate with them at all, or even speak to them about I, war comics? I, I've not met any of of that generation of American war comics artists. I became familiar with their work later on in my twenties. Sure. Um, and obviously you're talking about absolutely tremendous work. Um, I'm pleased to say I was able to work with, with Russ Heath. Uh, he, he did a, a, an enemy ace book for me. And um, I had the particular pleasure of working with John Severin on the Punisher. Wow. Uh, and although it wasn't technically a war comic, I did write in a little sort of Vietnam flashback for, for John to get his teeth into. And of course, he did a tremendous job. And he would have been one of the few American comic artists I would have heard of as a kid, not through superhero comics, but through Mad Magazine. When sure. my dad visited the States, he would pick up the little paperback digests of Mad. And so I saw all the fantastic artwork by people like Jack Davis uh, and Don Martin, and of course, uh, John Severin. So that was a treat getting to work with him. Uh, That's so I was, amazing. I, I, was, uh, I discovered their work later, you might say, and I've read, you know, Sergeant Rock and Haunted Tank and, and Enemy Ace and so on, but they weren't part of my childhood reading. Yeah. I, I had forgotten that you'd done that enemy ace series yeah. with Russ. And yeah, again, I mean, uh, well that, and it's, uh, it's great that beyond the stories you get into uh, both the hardware that uh, that's going on, but also again, I, I love uh, reading these characters, Corporal Styles, obviously from, uh, is it Styles? Mm. Say Styles from? Uh, Styles, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From, from Tankies. Great stuff, man. And I can't help but compare, uh, Styles and his uh, troop with uh, with Easy Company and some of the other uh, great gang war comics that uh, that we got here in America mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, I I really enjoy the story and truly, Garth, um, all of your stuff has really been an education. We, you okay. know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we in America, everything is so American focused, and it is so great to uh, read about. Uh, the other armies and God, you know, you, you've covered them all from the Germans to the Russians to, you know, I, and also again, all the different hardware 
that was mm-hmm. used. And especially in tankies, it's really interesting to hear about the comparisons because it, again, sometimes we just get the the cliff notes if we're only watching war movies and some of the the war tales that people write and, and tell. But this this really gets into the intricacies of uh, the Tiger tanks versus is it the Churchills that uh, the the British yeah, are right. using? Yeah, yeah, great stuff, man. Oh well, thanks. I mean, when I when I write war comics, when I'm choosing my my stories, um, I do tend to look further afield than uh, than the U.S. experience, just because I feel as if it's been covered so well. Um, uh, you know, books, movies, comic books. Um, there's you know a, a healthy surplus of this kind of material. Um, that doesn't mean I won't uh, look at the American experience sometimes. An idea will just grab hold of me. Um, I wrote one called the Tokyo Club for war stories. Um, Tokyo Club was the name given to the pilots uh, who flew uh, single-seat fighters from Iwo Jima towards the end of the war to escort the B-29s hitting Japan. And uh, these guys had to fly uh, Mustangs, single-seat fighters, loaded with fuel and ammunition, I think 600 miles across the open ocean, dogfight with the enemy to protect the bombers when they got to Japan and then fly home uh, back to Iwo Jima, another 600 miles, maybe in damaged aircraft, running low on fuel. Every pilot says that uh, his engine sounded that bit weaker over open water than, than over land. Um, and it's it's when something like that grabs hold of me, I I'll always want to write about it. A little detail like that. These guys, ironically, titling them, themselves the Tokyo Club. You know, all, that's all you had to do to join was make that trip. And as a special prize, you got to do it again the next day. Um, but for the most part, I will tend to look at maybe the British uh, uh, or the Russian uh, experience. Uh, I wrote one about the Israelis in the Yom Kippur War. I, I do tend to range far and wide and maybe a bit beyond what uh, a U.S. audience might normally be exposed to. Have you had the opportunity to speak directly to vets uh, that, that were in these various wars? Um, I did have the pleasure and the honor of meeting uh, one of the Tuskegee Airmen Wow. A few years ago. Yeah. Um, Dr. Roscoe Brown, uh, captain as was, um, when I did the series Dreaming Eagles for Aftershock um, about the Tuskegee Airmen, um, thanks to uh, some fellow aficionados, I was able to meet uh, Dr. Brown at his home in the Bronx. Um, now, sadly, he passed on a couple of years later, but at the at the time he was 94, and um, you can imagine at 94, couldn't really remember much about what he'd done the, the previous week, but he could certainly remember shooting down a Nazi jet fighter over Berlin in uh, in early 1945, and that was an interesting story, talking to him about it. Um, as he uh, uh, and being able to ask him, you know, how it felt and was it difficult? He, he said it was. I remember him saying it was surprisingly easy because, um, of course, the German jets, fast as they were, were attacking the American bombers, and they had to slow down a bit to match their speed to the bombers so they wouldn't overshoot, and that made them that bit easier for the American fighters to get at. Uh, also, I think at that point, a new sort of very basic computerized gun sight had been introduced that allowed uh, wow. aiming off or deflection shooting to be made that bit easier. But it, it, what was particularly interesting was uh, Dr. Brown said that he'd actually met some German jet pilots after the war. Uh, and he said it was really interesting because uh, he, he, he likened being a fighter pilot to being an Olympic athlete. Uh, and he said that when you meet the opposition, it's really interesting to compare tactics and hardware and experience because at the end of the day, you're two guys doing the same job. You happen to be on opposite sides. And for him, uh, for him to be able to do that and talk to these guys, I think was a bit of an eye opener, something I certainly wouldn't have expected. Well, and that's great because I see that in a lot of your stories, too. Mm-hmm. Where there are moments where the enemy and the, and the, and the allies you know, meet each other and... and, mm-hmm. and you know, have have these kind of almost casual conversations and mm. to try to kill each other. It's yeah. it's really it's amazing. But I, I again, like you said, they really are doing the same job. And you do hear these stories that 
you know, even, you know, during trench warfare in World War I, that these uh, these guys would have these moments and stuff where, you know, whether it was armistice or, or a moment of peace, I don't even know. But it just I, that always fascinates me. It's amazing that those things would happen. Yeah, it's it's uh, you, you do get these odd little encounters during the actual conflicts themselves. Mostly when you when you get people meeting like that, it does tend to happen after the conflict. Finished. Um, as you said, they were trying to kill each other. And so at the time, most would have been largely unsentimental. But uh, I know, for instance, that many American and British and German pilots got to know each other after the war, um, particularly the fighter pilots for whom there was that kind of hunter's instinct. Uh, they found that they had a lot in common. I know that um, after the Falklands War in 1982, uh, British and Argentinian veterans uh, got together reasonably soon afterwards to, you know, just to sort of reach out to one another uh, and find that uh, find that they had many problems in common and, and find their shared experience very interesting and uh, I think cathartic to talk about. Where you tend not to get it so much, it's not unheard of, but would be among the people who were absolutely at daggers drawn. Uh, the regimes, the, the men who represented the regimes that absolutely despised each other, the Germans and the Russians, for instance. Sure. Uh, and I know that with some exceptions, uh, it's been difficult for a lot of allied veterans to forgive and forget the Japanese. Sure. Um, that's not to say it didn't happen, but it was difficult for a long time, particularly men who'd been prisoners of the Japanese. Um, I think that took, uh, that took a, more of a step than it might for, say, a German and a British guy to forgive and forget. You know, and again, it's these kinds of stories. I always, I, it's so funny. It's been a recurring theme uh, over a lot of my interviews recently where I say, prior to the 90s, the 20th century has gaps in history and you really have to hunt down for the real story. I mean, mm. since the 90s, every, as I've said, every fart has been recorded for posterity, <laughs> whether we like it or not. But, yeah. um, but no, you know, and again, I, I, even, even the intricacies of war, I think, uh, thank God, you know, there are documentaries. God, I, I, I feel almost uncomfortable saying this, but I really appreciate it. I was going to say, I love the world at war that Olivier uh, narrated, you know, decades ago. But that was amazing because it had so many participants on on every side. And it really is amazing hearing the real stories. And thank God there are books like what you're doing in comics, but other histories that are coming out that you get these amazing conflicts and stories and just these, these again, encounters that, you know, the the broad strokes of war are just, you know, too too broad and you don't get to hear these these really fascinating little stories. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think there has been a conscious effort on the part of all concerned to record experience before the participants pass, uh, which they are now doing. Of course, I mean, yeah. many of them, the vast majority of the men who who served in World War II are gone. If you were 20 in 1940, hell, even if you were 18 in 1945, just in at the end. Sadly, you can't have long to go now. Um, yeah. It is, you know, touching on what you're saying, it is a big part of why I do what I do. Um, I, the way I see it, the participants in these in that, that particular conflict in the Second World War give us the world that, that we have. And for those of us in the Western democracies, of course, they saved us from all manner of horrors. And I can't help but think that it's only right that we should do what we can to keep their stories alive just a bit longer to tell new generations that these things did happen and that these men were forced to do these things. And we have the world that we've enjoyed as a result, uh, even if we are possibly making a bit of a hash of it. <laughs> they, they, did at least, they did at least give us the chance. Understood. You know, uh, also techies goes into the Korean conflict as well. That's right. Yeah, and, and they're, you know, a very different war. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, and and how many how many uh, stories have you done about the Korean conflict? Um, well, there was that tanky story, uh, and I also touched in it uh, quite late in the Night Witches saga. I I had the uh, lead character um, 
show up uh, training Korean pilots uh, on the same kind of aircraft that she'd flown during World War II. Beyond that, not much, although it is a particularly fascinating conflict just because five years after the end of World War II, this, this odd little conflict in Korea starts up and all three superpowers rapidly get involved. Um, things, I'm not sure how close to the brink they get, but things do get quite dangerous when, when the Chinese uh, begin their mass attacks and push the Allied forces, the United Nations forces south. I know that MacArthur, who'd been taken by surprise, wanted to use nuclear weapons to to halt the Chinese advance, and he would have simply been dropping the bombs on entire armies. Now, given that at that point the Russians had the bomb as well, that one could have spilled over into something very serious indeed. Instead, what you ended up with once the, the front stabilized and so on was really the first successful United Nations police action, as it was called, yes. where when, when the shooting stops, um, the map looks broadly like it looked at the beginning. There's still a South Korea, there's still a North Korea, and the superpowers pull back. Um, that cost, I think, 50,000 American lives, possibly 12,000 British. I may be, that, that figure, second figure may be off, but I know it was several thousand, definitely. And yet no one really knows about that. And that's, that's an example of what I'm talking about. When I, when I read about the, uh, the Gloucester Regiment defending that hill, uh, and in particular, uh, as, as regards to the tankies, um, the British running those tanks down that highway on a sort of all or nothing rescue mission to try and get the men from the other regiment side the other battalions who were stuck on those hills, I knew it would be kind of the perfect way to cap off the tanky story to give Styles, who's been through the hell of the Second World War and ended up really with a head full of broken glass, to give him a chance to kind of resolve a lot of those issues and bring what you might call his, his personal mission to a conclusion. Understood. Yeah, man, you don't hold back and neither do the artists when it comes to uh, the damage that, that people suffered because of these mm. encounters. God, I remember years ago reading uh, probably about one of your World War One vets, and I believe it was a World War II uh, soldier that was remembering like his father or seeing a, a World War One vet all bandaged up, no no limbs, no no sight. Yeah. yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's that's actually funny. You should mention that Carlos Escara drew that one too. That's from wow. The- that's from the war story we did. It was called Condors, and it's it's in the second collection, and it's the one where you have four uh, participants in the Spanish Civil War from the two sides stuck in a shell hole. Yes. And uh, they're all telling their stories, and it's the German pilot who talks about seeing his father come back from World War One, no arms, no eyes, really just kind of a vegetable that has to be spoon-fed by his mother, and... And that is that experience feeds into his notion of of Germany have to fight, having to fight another battle, Germany having to rise again, the Germans getting a chance that they, that he would have been told that they were denied in 1918, uh, and of course that ultimately goes nowhere good. Uh, but yeah, that was Carlos as well. You know, I think that was the first serious war story we did together. And so it would have been about five or six years after that when I was starting to get battlefields together that, and, and I knew he would be a perfect fit for the tankies. Um, because he's so good with character and because he can, he's such a good storyteller and he could always bring moments like the one you're, you're talking about to life. You know, I'm, I'm looking up right now because I want to, I want to say uh, the publisher correctly uh, here. Uh, you know, is this uh, the um, is it the name the naval? And you know, I'm looking, I'm looking on their the page. Naval. Yeah, the, the, the oh, Dead Reckoning. Yeah, Dead Reckoning, and the you know who's reckoning. behind who's behind Dead Reckoning? Yeah, that's like the Naval Institute Press. Yeah, yeah, right. and you know, I I just uh, I I spoke to uh, the actor Lawrence Luckenbill, who mm-hmm. adapted his one man show of Teddy Roosevelt into a graphic novel with them. Oh, 
And uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, how, how did you hook up with Dead Reckoning? Um, it was a couple of years ago. Their, uh, their editor-in-chief, Gary Thompson, got in touch with me. Uh, and he said, look, we're, we're setting up, we, at the Naval Institute Press, we're setting up an outfit called Dead Reckoning. We're going to be doing war comics. You're a natural fit. And uh, obviously agreed. And um, I can't remember who suggested it first, doing the Night Witches collection. Um, might have been them, might might have been me, but it was a great way for us all to dip our toes in the waters, as it were, just to sort of see what it would be like to work together. Sure. Um, because it is nice to to get that sense of how things will go. And they did a great job on the Night Witches. Then I did an original graphic novel uh, with them called The String Bags that came out last year. Okay. And then after that, the Tankies was the obvious next step. You know, the other ongoing serialized story from battlefields so um yeah they proved to be a great fit um great people to work with and as gary said you know uh, it just seemed obvious you know i should be working for them that's great man and i and i forgive the question if it's too personal because i don't want to get into your business but do you have control of uh, your your stuff over the years i know dynamite re-released uh, war stories and i know war stories originally came from dc but do you have the ability to or Actually, um, War Story, the first two books from of War Stories came out from DC. Right. And then, then we went over to Avatar, who currently have it in print. Um, and then Dynamite would be Battlefield. Excuse me. Aftershock, Dreaming Eagles, and Out of the Blue, and Dead Reckoning, the string bags. And yes, the, the, the answer to your question is yes, I, I have control. I'm, I'm the owner of the vast majority of that material. Obviously, things like uh, the old Enemy Ace book that you mentioned or um, sure. some of the uh, classic British characters I've written, like Battler Britain or more obviously Johnny Red. Yep. They're, owned, they're owned and controlled by the publishers, but most sure. of my stuff I, I do have control of, yeah. That's cool. Was your father a vet? No, he was not. Um, he was too young for the Second World War, and there was never conscription in Northern Ireland anyway, um, as there was in, in the mainland UK. Um, his uncle, Uncle Joe, uh, did fight in Tunisia during Operation Torch uh, with the Inniskilling Regiment, Wow! Um, where sadly he lost a leg. Um, I, I met him uh, briefly, Joe died when I was quite young, but I do remember talking to him and I remember him, uh, you know, tapping his prosthetic leg and talking about how he still had shrapnel inside him. Um, I remember my dad saying after that, that Joe had told me more about uh, his experiences in Tunisia than, um, than he, than he had anyone else. I think just cause all of a sudden he, he had a, an avid listener. You know, uh, all my uncles served in world war II. My dad, huh? Uh, yeah, and it was pretty amazing hearing their stories as much as they were willing to tell them. And my father blew my mind because he was part of the occupation force that was in Vienna mm-hmm. after the war. He was in training for, I believe it's called Operation Olympia, which would have been the right. last vision of Japan yeah. if the bomb didn't work. And right. I always remind my sister, I'm like, uh, God, we're like two of the like, thank God, you know, you hate to say that because so many people obviously died. But it's like uh, dad could have died on the on the you know shores of Japan if yeah. they had to do the land invasion. And the, oh, the amazing thing for me was um, one night he came to me and he said, "Hey, you want to know what I did uh, when I was in the army?" I said, "Sure." And he sat me down and we watched the third man. Oh right. right. And and he was an MP going after black marketeers. So I had and I'm like, wow. So I have this real connection to that uh-huh. movie. I I wonder, um, have you ever written and would you write? As opposed to frontline stories, any espionage uh, stories, and if you have, I, I I've missed them, and I'd love to know about it if you've already done that. Um, not not really the kind of thing you're talking about. I mean, I, I have written, um, and these are the other kinds of war stories I've written with um, with the Punisher, right? Sure, and uh, Nick Fury. Sure. I've written a good bit about Vietnam, but also about the Cold War. I had. Uh, Fury in uh, Indochina, um, in uh, Cuba, 
and Vietnam, and then later in the 80s in Nicaragua, which which are all sort of the big uh, Cold War sites. That, But as for a pure espionage story, no, not really. Um, I tend to prefer battlefield stories, sure. meaning not the series, but stories on the battlefield, yes. rather than the secret mission or espionage stuff. That's just where my taste tends to lie. Understood. That's cool. I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by the OSS and uh, British intelligence and what everybody was doing before mm-hmm. the war, during the war, certainly during the Cold War. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, in particular. I did, I suppose, um, I did touch on that uh, when I was writing The Boys, and I went back into what the, the leader of the, the original unit, uh, Colonel Mallory, had been up to. And I had him as one of those bright eyed boys that uh, came out of the OSS or joined the OSS just after World War II. That, of course, then becomes the CIA. And yep. you get this you get this bizarre period where really a bunch of sort of waspy Harvard graduates and so on <laughs> think they can take on the KGB. Well, NKVD as would have been then. Um, or were they the key KGB at that point? Anyway, the point is they go head to head with Russian intelligence and it doesn't really work out terribly well for anyone. <laughs> I mean, the, the Cold War is, it's, gosh, it's it's one long history of disasters, really. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, given that the alternative was nuclear immolation. Yeah, we got um, that, so that, that yeah. That's really the one area where I did touch on that. Understood. Yeah, I... Uh... I don't know. I'm fascinated by that. You know, in particular, uh, I come from uh, news broadcasting and Mm -hmm. um, the story of George Polk, who they say uh, in American circles, they say was the first casualty of the Cold War. He was a CBS radio uh, correspondent that was Mm -hmm. investigating the corruption in the Greek government. And I'm Greek. So Mm -hmm. that in particular fascinated me. And Mm -hmm. like you said, yeah, there's just a ton of uh, not wanting to get to the bottom of who ex- actually killed him. And Howard K. Smith, a great newscaster from America, tried to get mm-hmm. to the bottom of it and was told by Bill Donovan and his uh, underlings, you got to drop it, man, because uh, we, uh, you know, if, if we really peel that onion, it might be the Greek government. It might be paramilitary groups that were supportive. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, we, we got to dance with the Greeks that are in government right now. If not, the communists are going to come and overrun uh, Greece. Yeah. So we kind of have no, no choice but to, to run with these guys. And it really is that fascinating, like, well, what are we fighting for when we're propping up some of these assholes that are, you know, out there? It's, yeah. it, it, it's as fascinating as the, the stuff that was happening on the front lines to me. I think so. And there, there is an interesting sort of split here between what goes on on the battlefield and what goes on behind the scenes in what we might call black ops or the world of espionage because coming out of world war ii you do have so many people who worked um in uh in intelligence and they may have formed the idea that uh, a great many of them may have gotten the idea that it was them and their clandestine activity uh that really with them pulling the strings as it were that really decided the matter as opposed to the guys on the battlefield who who met the enemy head on now both are important but as has been pointed out intelligence is only good up to a point if you can't match and defeat the enemy face to face on the battlefield it doesn't really matter what kind of intelligent coup, intelligence coup you've managed to put off but Everyone comes out of a war thinking they were the one, or many people of the kind we're talking about, come out of a war thinking they were the ones who made it happen. They were the ones who held the key to victory, put the key in the lock and so on. Um, Ultimately, they like to think it was down to them. And you can see how that could inform what I call that sense of entitlement after the war. Whereas, okay, new enemy now, we'll just apply the same methods, we'll get the same result. And, of course, that goes somewhere somewhere pretty bad. What about the conflicts from the last 20 or 30 years? Do they hold any fascination uh, for you? Um, They do to a point. Um, What you're really talking about there are what are called low-intensity insurgency-based 
conflicts. And they're more interesting to me, perhaps, as the backdrops for stories. I, I had a lot of, uh, I had a, n- a number of Punisher stories involved with um, Afghanistan and so on. Uh, so th- th- they are of interest to me, but um, when it comes to the war stories, I'm going to focus more on actual battlefield action. Um, not always going to be World War II. I mean, as you said, on Korea, there's the Vietnam story, as I mentioned. I, I wrote the um, Israeli story, uh, the story about the Israeli tank crew in the Yom Kippur War, and yeah. um, also the one I mentioned um with the Spanish Civil War. So I'm going to tend to stay on the battlefield for most of what I write. Understood. Are there new stories in the works uh, for you, world-wise? Yeah, Yeah. Um, there's going to be uh, a new series from Aftershock called The Lion and the Eagle with art by uh, PJ Holden, who drew the string bags. And that's a story about the British in Burma in 1944, um, featuring the Chindits who were a sort of British special forces operation um, uh, or operators who uh, made a couple of incursions behind the lines in in Burma in 1943 and 44. And this is something else that interests me, what, what, and it ties into what I was talking about. Uh, just like just like the spies and the spy masters, people sometimes get an almost romantic idea about what special forces do and what they can achieve. We, we like the idea, of course, because um, it's a small group of people, highly skilled, highly capable, well-equipped, behind enemy lines, cloak and dagger stuff. I mean, yep. We love that in comics. We love Absolutely. that in TV and so on. But, of course, the question is, how much difference do they really honestly make how much damage can, say, four, eight, ten guys really do? And if you're perhaps diluting your main effort by taking the best guys and putting them into these special units that you only use occasionally, what does that do to the regular army units that have to go that have to go on to um, the battlefield and meet the enemy? I think it's interesting that the, the British and Americans in particular fell in love with these notions in World War II. Um, uh, I know Churchill was a huge uh, advocate of special forces. Um, he created the Special Operations Executive and gave them the order, set Europe ablaze. The idea was you would have these guys who would parachute into occupied countries, hook up with the local resistance and play havoc behind the German lines. And that sounds good. But in so many instances, these guys, when they did meet up with the resistance, found that there were all sorts of problems with local politics, all kinds of complications. Quite often, different resistance groups, say in the Balkans uh, or Greece, um, or even in France, where you had the McKay and the communists, quite often they would be more interested in using the guns they were being sent on each other rather than the Germans. Um, wow. You also have the question of, if you start messing with the Germans, if you start blowing up railways or crossroads or uh, power factories, well, if the German answer to that is usually to, to go to the local civilian population and shoot 10 of them for every one German who was hurt. Now, it doesn't take much of that before the local people are going to lose interest in supporting the resistance. I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here. Not at all. Fascinating. <laughs> For me, it, it is interesting when you compare the, the efforts by the guys who think they have some magical formula to almost short circuit a war, to solve the problems in record time with just a small number of highly trained individuals. And you ask, well, what did you really do? What difference did you really make? Um, and on the other hand, um, the guys in the the main army and air force and navy units who fight the war head to head with the enemy um it's it might almost be said that that the whole concept of special forces as it applies to intelligence might only have found its its real place in the past 20 or 30 years in what's what i've called the low intensity conflicts Uh, i mean after all when you're fighting an insurgency you do not need a battalion of tanks right you probably need guys who can blend in with the, the local civilian population, gather intelligence, and then 
hit a particular terrorist unit at the exact moment. So so long as you're not on the battlefield, maybe special forces and so on have have uh, truly found their place. Are, uh, what do you think of that and the remote control battles that we kind of seem to be waging, you know, in, in current conflicts and stuff? Yeah, um, I would say that so, so long as these conflicts continue, and they will, of course, um, I would say it, it, there there is a degree of sense to it. A drone strike is an enormously destructive event. Um, you know, shooting one or two missiles into a house, so you're going to kill X number of people, and there will be collateral damage. But given as the that the alternative is a full on airstrike, possibly even involving the B-52s, which we know can each aircraft can take out an area the size of a football field, then perhaps the drone alternative does make a kind of sense. Um, so long as these conflicts continue, as I say, and I don't see them stopping anytime soon, uh, that does seem to be the way forward. Understood. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're moving forward yourself in terms of uh, new stories and Oh yeah. And by the way, after well, I've been, I mean, yeah, you're not going to stop writing, which is great. But of course, more war stories, and uh, that's terrific. Uh, no, no disrespect to Dead Reckoning, but AfterShock is a paying sponsor of Word Balloon, so I'm going to have to arrange with uh, with Joe Pruitt and those guys to uh, have you back if you're willing uh, to talk. Oh, about happily, it. yeah. Oh, that'd I mean, be great, man. Yeah, that that'd be good. I mean, you know that they, they they published Dreaming Eagles, they published Out of the Blue. Yep, they'll be doing this line in the Eagle book. So yeah, that would be terrific. Oh, it'd be my pleasure, man. And seriously, Tankies is excellent, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. And really do appreciate uh, the projects that Dead Reckoning have been finding lately, and and uh, putting in uh, in paper and digitally as well. So uh, congratulations, man. I, I'm glad that this uh, series is back. And I think it's a great tribute to Carlos and uh, his wonderful work. And uh, I hope, uh, yeah, we'll talk in the future more about uh, about uh, your war stories and stuff. It's uh, It's been a pleasure talking to you today. You too, John, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. There you go, Garth Ennis. Uh, I hope you'll check out Tankies from Dead Reckoning. And, uh, man, I, I guess uh, there's a lot more uh, war stuff coming up. And I look forward to my next conversation with Garth. I really think uh, he's one of the best modern uh, war comic writers and uh, it's great to see his stuff as it comes out i hope you have enjoyed uh april here in word balloon we're not done yet we still have one more day and uh, i've got some great interviews lined up and i'm getting my shot today my vaccine so uh hopefully uh, i won't have uh, too many uh, ill after effects and my intent is to put out at least one more day of word balloon either one or two uh, episodes and uh, if not, then uh, May is already stacked up with great conversations. Uh, waiting in the wings, we've got people like Ed Brubaker, Dan Slott, and uh, Rob Paulson, the great uh, voiceover artist. I'm also going to be talking to Elsa Chartier early next week. Uh, so it's uh, going to be already a very busy May and a great way to usher in Word Balloon's 16th anniversary on May 10th. Thanks a lot for, as always, uh, your support on Word Balloon and uh, listening today to uh, the great conversation with Garth Ennis. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. April's going to be a fun month for Aftershock. Lots of really neat stuff happening. Uh, we've got the third part of Shadow Doctor coming from Peter Calloway and George Genty. Uh, that will be out at the end of the month. Also, uh, April 12th, you've got Eden, the prestige format One Shock, as uh, they put it in Aftershock, with uh, Cullen Bunn and Talabak Tazjelik. Uh, they have been a great team, and it's great to see something new in the horror world from them. Also, Animosity Year, year 3, the collection, is uh, coming from Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour. That's coming on April 21st. Uh, also, uh, I Breathe the Body. Uh, is already out. Zach Thompson, Andy McDonald, issue three. So you should definitely check that out. Stephanie Phillips with Nuclear Family. That continues as well for Aftershock. Uh, she and Tony Chastine with that really neat 50s Cold War story. Uh, plus, they have a brand new imprint for uh, young adults, and it's called uh, Seismic Press. And their first release for that is going to be Rainbow Bridge. It's by uh, Steve Orlando and Steve Fox. Uh, and uh, it's illustrated by Valentina Brancati. Uh, it's coming out this summer, and uh, it's a brand new imprint for Aftershock Comics. They got a lot going on 
that deserves your attention. So uh, don't uh, hesitate to uh, go to their website and find out more information about these and other fine books from Aftershock Comics. They're a great sponsor of Word Balloon, and they deserve your attention. They always have top writers and artists making really great books that you are not going to find at any other publisher. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages of art, and the diamond codes on how to order these books and more at AfterShockComics.com. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2021. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.